Welcome to RV Talk Radio. Here we talk about RV living, RV lifestyles, and RV travel. We also celebrate the RV lifestyle that gives us the chance to do outdoor activities that we couldn't do in a normal lifestyle. So thanks for joining us. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and let's talk about RVs. Well, hello everyone. This is Rob Scribner from RV Talk Radio. This is episode 75. And yes, today we're going to bring up the subject. Is the nomadic lifestyle and stealth campers, are they abusing or causing issues with RV resources and services that we all share? Let's talk about it. So here we go. We're going to talk about probably a sensitive subject, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of hate mail and and uh, comments about this. But what I want to do is set some ground rules. Now, first of all, uh, of course, I'm an older RVer, and uh, I try not. I'm going to try not to bring up any of my prejudices about basically old beliefs of RVing, and uh, and try to embrace all of it. Now, there's all kinds of RVers out there, from van dwellers to Class Cs to trailer and, and fifth wheel type to motorhomes. And, and so <clears throat> what I want to do is talk about, um, and I, I guess I'm seeing it a lot more in um, more younger generation, but there's a lot of resources out there for all the RVers for us to use. And then there's situations sometimes in cities and stuff like that where we need the resources of spending the night in a city and being able to park overnight and uh, not be violating any ordinances or parking codes. And so I want to kind of talk about this kind of stuff. And I am urging the listener to leave comments that are constructive for others. And this isn't to cause hate whatsoever. But there's a lot of, especially younger people or couples or partners that are thinking that hopping in an RV and traveling all over and doing work camping or or working from their RVs or uh, doing programs where they get money sent to them for creating content, which is uh, all good. Uh, is a great lifestyle, and so they think it's really neat to be able to travel and, and find ways to keep their costs down because they're not making very much money to avoid uh, RV park um, costs and their overhead. So they're looking to you know use Walmart sometimes or or Home Depots or Cabela's. Um, I think uh, Pro Bass shops you might be able to get away with some of that stuff. Uh, And then there's facts of just traveling long distances, even up to Alaska, places like that are turnouts and places to stay um, to avoid basically the cost of paying for overnight RV resource um, parks or resources or resorts, I should say. So anyway, I want to kind of talk about all these things. And I also want to go in depth since I'm really just sticking my neck out here on all this stuff. I also want to talk about um, the nickname, and I don't want to call it this, but it, um, but the um, ways of raising income on the road that are uh, a, a different way of doing it other than work camping. And so I'm avoiding that big E word. And so uh, anyway, so let's get started. My frame of mind on this whole subject tends to be a little bit fatherly because I have, uh, my kids are now in their 30s. So I'm kind of, I take the approach of thinking about my 20, 30 year old um, kids out there that would be traveling the United States. And as a father, I would say I'd be excited as I'll get out for them at the same time being concerned about their careers and the future. And and the reason I say that is traveling is like an addiction. <laughs> it's 
And there's even been people that have traveled like sailing for years and then come off the water to try to go back to a regular lifestyle and actually have a hard time at it. So I, I, I get concerned that uh, once you're uh, engulfed into this lifestyle and then some reason you're forced or decided to come off the road and become, and I don't want to even say the word, but it's as close as I can get as being kind of normal of going back to nine to five and maybe getting a household and raising children and, and you know, the American dream type thing. <clears throat> yeah, and I know what's, what's the American dream. Well, you know, and of course with RVing, the big word they'll use is RV freedom. And as a father, I say, well, RV freedom, okay, so you're out there in an RV, you might own your RV, but do you own anything else? What's yours? Is the places you stay yours? Is, you know, and, and is traveling all the time and looking over your shoulder Wondering if someone's going to knock on the side of the door and say, you're not supposed to be parked here. Uh, I worry about that. I, and I'm just being truthful. Now, once again, this is not a show to try to get people upset. What I'm trying to do is bring this up for discussion. I'm hoping the comments that we get from all of this, and I, I urge other people to read them, is advice of how to make this work well how to not abuse our resources that we have as our viewers and what is some good practices. For example, <clears throat> a lot of folks will use a Walmart and there's a few things of, you know, etiquette that needs to be followed or all, you know, because we're already losing Walmarts that will not allow us to stay overnight. And the reason is there's abuse pretty much. And there's little things that we can do to reduce that one is make it an overnight stay and really the best thing to do it in our uh, Walmart is to get there in the evening and leave in the morning and try not to stay during the afternoons because that's their busy time um, dropping our levelers uh, uh, that can be hard under concrete that's one thing um, and reducing the chances of, of, of pulling our slides now, I understand in a lot of rigs, we got to open our slides or you can't even move around. So I would say that at least at nighttime, when the evening or the stores are starting to close, that's a great time when you could probably pull those out. It wouldn't really be noticed that much and you stay way in the back in the uh, non-busy section of the parking lot. So yeah, um, it's really important to be courteous and these companies yes they can benefit from us being there and of course we want to do our shopping and we should do something that contributes to that company allowing us to be there and the other thing is it causes problems is that company's resources like garbage in restrooms um, sometimes we're using those and if we have there's um, <laughs> our viewers out there that will have like a couple of days worth of garbage and put it all in uh, Walmart's garbage. And of course, you know, they go out there and they're stuffed and they're full. And it's like, who's using my garbage? And it's the RVers. And so, you know, uh, little things like that or when someone's going to put their foot down and say, you know what? Our garbage has gone up like, you know, 10% because we're letting RVers in here. And... Uh, maybe they're a very busy store and we got too many RVs actually causing issues with parking. Um, they're going to shut us down. And, you know, most shows I watch that are nomadic travelers are pretty good about knowing about coming in late, leaving in the mornings, not abusing it. But there's others that just, they just don't care and they don't look through the eyes of the companies that are allowing this. And it's just like, you know, our new president, people say, oh my gosh, he's a crazy guy. Well, he sees through different eyes than we do. He's a, a business person. Well, of course, these people that own these companies are business people. And so they're looking at the bottom line. Should they? Well, yeah, <laughs> they're businesses. They employ people. If it costs them more to have us parking in their parking lots, then it is, um, if they're not seeing revenue or seeing a benefit to it, why would they want to do that? 
because they're a community thing. They don't have to be. They're a business that employ people. And their bottom line is making a profit and being able to pay their people without and make, you know and make a profit doing it. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with those companies thinking that way. And so we should try to think um, like the companies of if I'm there, what am I doing to benefit that company to get the privilege of parking overnight for free? Do you ever ask yourself that question? And of course, as a father, if I was looking, and I'm just, I'm going to look at it through the father's eyes of looking at maybe my kids are out there doing this nomadic lifestyle. And uh, I'd be thrilled for them that they're seeing all the world, and, and, and it's no doubt about that. But I'd also be worried about safety. And I'd be really worried if my daughter and uh, partner um, or husband uh, was, I'm going to put it that way because my kids are straight and they have husbands or wives. So anyway, if they're out there, I'd be like, where is that kid taking my daughter? Are they staying in places that are like there's like real limited areas in New Orleans? And some of them can be questionable areas. Uh, is my daughter in danger? <laughs> and of course, I love my my um, set of laws and stuff like that. So I'd be worried about them being in danger too, of course. And uh, so what protections do you have in some of these places? Because when you're traveling, you don't know the areas. You try your best, but you don't know if it's a good area. And even a good area can be bad. And what's to keep someone from knocking on your door and pulling a gun on you guy, uh, on, on you and and taking anything that's well, it, it could be terrible, just terrible stuff that could happen. And I don't want to be negative about it, but as as opposed to stealth camping in an RV park, the likelihood of better security and a community of people that watch out for each other, in a sense, uh, I would be, I would assume, be safer than being out on your own independently on strange roads and highways, uh, whether you're in um, our states or whether you're traveling up to Canada or in Mexico, uh, heading down to Baja, things like that. It's always better to be a community and watching out for one another. And of course, you know, there's the discussion of, do you keep protection on the RV. Well, that's a whole nother uh, ball game trying to deal with, can you have firearms in each state? What's the laws? What happens if you want to go to Alaska? What do you do with uh, crossing the border? And, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's just a lot of questionable things. And of course, then you get into the thing that concerns me is in the cities, you know, that there is RVers out there that have RVers out parked on the side of roads in cities that don't even have an engine that works. And we say, well, most of these guys doing the channels and making all that, they're not like that. Well, no, they're not, because they if they got enough money to make a channel and do video, they most likely can have an RV that works. But what you don't see is the local community of, of homeless, in a sense, are parking on the side of roads and they got busted out windows and their engines don't work and if they move they can actually get towed and so the cities are going uh, uh this is getting bad and of course uh amongst that will be the travelers coming through doing like an overnight knowing that this is a place they could park that is overnight and they leave the next morning and that's kind of like how they'd like it to be but that's and then there's others that come in and they'll stay a few days and don't rotate their RV to different locations. And and um, a lot of the people that are in the cities will tell you that they need to move their rig every day. And um, uh, Justin Credible is a good example of, he's done some really good shows about uh, talking about um, abiding by the city ordinances and um, having a good looking rig and he doesn't use the, like the word stealth because your, your stealth, if you get a rig that is not an eyesore 
It's not sitting in the same place all the time. And he describes stealth camping um, in a very good way. And I really uh, uh, admire him of how he uh, defined that for everyone. And um, he says, my, my RV, <laughs> he's got a Class C. He's like, it doesn't look stealthy at all. It's just clean and it's not an eyesore. And he moves it every day like he's supposed to. No problem. What I would really enjoy seeing from this show is like just incredible where he shared information. I thought, well, other people that admire his lifestyle, uh, he defined it well as, uh, as, you know, uh, common sense, uh, following the rules, um, understanding the rules, and also having a rig that is not an eyesore. And to live his lifestyle of living in the city, having a job, and living in an RV to keep his overhead low, um, works well, and he does it well. And so, but there's others that don't. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and some of those lifestyles, you know, there's a lot of things like, oh, it looks really wonderful. But then you start, if you actually get out there and realize you want to do a lot of test runs, you realize that living out of a van has a lot of limitations, little things will just drive you crazy from uh, just having some room to stretch to restroom facilities, things like that, and how to deal with all that and water and cooking and all those things. Um, but once again, it's all about, uh, on this show, is are there are resources being abused? And so um, I've even heard, and, I, and I'm hearing this from the RV parks, where um, nomadics will come in late at night in the RV park, spend the night in one of their spaces, and leave early in the morning without paying. And that's the kind of stuff that, um, and, and of course, we're talking about a minority of people that would do that, but they're doing it. And the problem is, is what's that doing for the reputation of the people in the Class Bs and small Class C uh, type of, uh, in the small trailers too? Of doing a nomadic lifestyle and trying to be stealthy and then abusing things like RV parks and RV resorts. And, um, you know, of course, when somebody comes in that's le legitimate, they're already looked down upon, they're stereotyped. And, and that's not good either. <clears throat> and so, um, and then of course we got our parks, um, are they being taken care of? And the big thing of, of that is, uh, are we, you know, if you're bringing garbage in, are you bringing garbage out? Are you taking care of those resources? So the next person behind you, one is, can use it too. And, you know, how many of these places are getting shut down or not available to us because the states can't upkeep them because they're too costly because of resources being abused. And, and so, <clears throat> Anyway, these are the kinds of things that really should be talked about and really more videos should be done about etiquette and proper ways of, of using these resources without losing them. And it would be really nice to see more videos come out about how do you handle uh, the policies of uh, the cities, uh, the ordinances, how do you... Uh, respect the companies that are allowing us to use their facilities and then are you respecting the state facilities like uh, um, park and rides are you taking advantage of those really shouldn't be or um, the uh, rest stations uh, which in a lot of cases are not the safest place to overnight and truck stops are you uh, using those facilities and are you respecting the resources there that aren't abused and are you causing issues that the truck drivers would start looking down or stereotyping us and so what i'm concerned about is i don't want to pull into a walmart with my rig and some manager there assumes that i'm going to abuse the the situation and i get the you know <laughs> The riot act of yes, you can stay here overnight, but but don't do this, don't do that, and big riot, and uh, and rant. <clears throat> I just want to come in and out and and um, not cause an issue. I just need a place to stop overnight and sleep so we can uh, hit the road the next day. And it'd, it'd be nice not to have 
to pay $35 for an RV park. Uh, that just drives me crazy. It's like buying a motel room for 100 bucks or more, and you get there late at night and leave in the morning, you feel so ripped off because you spent all that money and got nothing out of the facility at all. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, it's, uh, what I really, 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 really want out of all this is good feedback. Hopefully others will see, you know, see this show and I'm sure some will watch them thinking it's going to be something nasty and it's not. Um, but I hope it helps produce more of these kind of shows of just plain old stealth traveling etiquette would be wonderful to help um, police ourselves without more rules and regulations coming out. Of course, the next thing that probably comes out of your mouth, well, there's only a handful of people ruining this. Well, here's the example of a handful of people ruining things, and I'm going to apply it to hunting. Now, for example, I'm from Washington State, and I used to hunt in a place called Brewster. And as a kid, we were uh, we had the opportunities to go out to these giant farmers that had wheat fields along the Columbia River, and we could go hunting. And we could literally drive onto their land and spend the night or camp on the properties and hunt the areas. And these are big, vast areas and hundreds and hundreds of acres. And so over time, uh, I remember one time in my kids, you know, second generation, my kids, I take them hunting up the burster, and we come and find out all the gates are locked. So we drive up to the owner, which we always give him a bottle of booze for uh, being grateful you're using this property. And he says, I just can't open the gates anymore. People are ruining my fences, leaving gates open. Cows are getting into the weed areas and and uh, guys are shooting up signs and, and abusing my property. And you know it was only a, you know a handful because when we came in, we actually called the owner every year, and we also stopped by the owner and left him like a bottle of Crown Royal or something as a, uh, being grateful for using his property. And the same person, of course, was grateful that we stopped by, and I still gave him a bottle of booze, and he still said, "Yes, you're welcome to hunt on my property, but you have to stay up at the top." We're talking miles and miles of property, and really changed our hunting aspects of uh, what we did in the future because we didn't have the access to to that whole area where we could just camp right in the middle of it and we could work our way down to the Columbia, or work our way up. Uh, and, uh, of course, there's other hunters there, so it would all be this like big parking lot of people camping in their trucks in this one area in the front of his gate. And so it really changed everything. And it, and it, it was ruined by a handful of people. And that's where I'm worried about with all this abuse uh, going on that we need to regulate these guys. And if we see them doing something, we need to somehow report them or somehow coach them. Or uh, And I know that's you know easier said than done. Uh, there's just, and we're talking a very small percentage, but they're you know staying in these parks or staying in stores like Walmarts for more than one day and are literally, uh, you know, and, and of course they'll call the financial card out. Well, I don't have any place to go and I don't have any money and I need to stay here. And so, wow. And of course the business is saying, well, why do I have to put up with this? And, and they don't have to, they're a business there. And why people can't see beyond that. But, um, all I can say is try to think of the Walmart being yours and you're the owner and operator of that store. What would you do if someone was really filling up your garbage cans and when somebody was using your property, which there could be big liability issues too that we haven't even addressed here. Uh, as a business owner, I know that a lot of us say we want to be kind to one another and things like that. The bottom line is you can be as kind as you want, but you won't be so kind when you get a lawsuit against you because someone broke their leg in your parking lot. And that's reality. And that's sad. I'm not saying that's <laughs> a shame. But as a business owner, how would you feel? What would you do? And what would you do to protect the future of your company and your employees because a handful of RVers want to use your parking lot, 
you'd probably shut it down, say, sorry, no overnighting here. This is a business of operation, and I'm going to put a security guard out there and check my parking lot, and if you, someone's camping in it, you're going to get towed away or a cop's going to be knocking on your door. <laughs> and, uh, and that's just how it is. And uh, we're hoping it doesn't get to that, but I do hear more and more and more uh, Walmarts and other stores saying no to overnight camping. And why is that happening? Before I go any deeper into the subject, i got to kind of identify one of our sponsors, which is goodmusicradio.com, which is a full-time internet station that we actually own and is actually contributing to this podcast, and we appreciate that. And if you ever get the opportunity to try internet radio, if it's the station you like, what's cool about it is it's good anywhere you go. So if you're in the East Coast, West Coast, whatever, you, good music radio can play there anywhere, um, any country, as long as you get the internet. So when you get an opportunity, uh, good music radio is nothing but greatest hits of past and present, uh, never gets tiresome, and constantly we're hoping that when you listen to the show, you go, wow, I haven't heard that one in a while, and that's a good tune. That's what good music radio is all about. So when you get the chance, check out goodmusicradio.com. You can download a free app to your cell phone and turn your cell phone into a little transistor radio. And, uh, of course, uh, the other things we want to tell you about is uh, please take the time to contact us. If you'd like to contact us privately, just go to our webpage at rvtalkradio.com. Go to the contact button and send us a note that way. Uh, of course, you can also go to our Facebook pages, which is RV Talk Radio has got its own Facebook. So does uh, RV Travel Buddy. Hit the little messy bet- button at the top. That's private too. And that comes right to us. And we can actually uh, answer you quite quickly from there. And uh, last, but, you know, last but not least, you can also contact me directly at Rob, R-O-B, at RVTalkRadio.com and shoot us your notes. Otherwise, just use the comment section below on uh, either the podcast or also um, uh, on the video. We have a video version of this, and some of you guys listen to this on YouTube, and others listen through podcast software. And uh, anyway, so (laughs) please shoot us a note. We're not looking for hate mail. We're looking for constructive feedback to give to others. How can we prevent us from losing more RV resources because of abuse. And that's really what the subject's all about. So the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, uh, of course, (laughs) uh, earning an income on this kind of lifestyle. These folks that want to be these stealth nomadic livers, uh, living on uh, on, on RV and not necessarily even wanting to do work camping. And so there's this word out there and it has and I'm going to avoid it cuz it's there's really good and bad about it but I there's big channels out there that uh, literally have people either sending them gifts or sending people money and that's okay especially if they're creating a content that you're enjoying so but there's others out there that go out there and and they I'm Anytime they have a crisis, there's literally folks out there that have like been traveling, doing videos, and lose a transmission or something breaks, and they'll get on there and start asking for money, and and it really looks bad. And then there's the other ones that will do these subtle hits. If you've been watching some of these programs long enough and a crisis comes up, they're all set up for PayPal and, and Patreon and all these things that you know that they're trying to get money out of you without actually saying the word, please send money. Um, now, uh, there's other, there's like, for example, I actually pay on a, patreon account that i enjoy watching because i love the content and it has nothing to do with rvs it's actually called sv delos and what this is is a a a group of uh, folks that have been traveling uh, the world uh, by sailboat and just really put on a great show and uh, uh, i just anytime one of their episodes come out i get excited which tells me that uh, I'd like to contribute to them um, to 
help them along with their lifestyle. And what their lifestyle isn't exactly the kind of lifestyle I like, but they produce content that I like. And so I contribute to them. And, uh, uh, for example, and yes, we have a Patreon account. And we also have people that give us uh, tips. And we also sell stickers and things like that. And ours, we identify as a business. We pay taxes on everything. So uh, anything that comes into us, we actually run through the company books, which is a corporation. And so <clears throat> I wish everybody would actually do that because there's people making money on the Internet that are uh, getting money given to them and not paying their fair share of taxes. And so, you know, I have an issue with that because I do. And our company does. And we take great pride in that. Is, is it difficult? Yes. Is it more paperwork? Yes. Is it the right thing to do? Yes. Is it the law? Yes. And so <laughs> um, it's just how it is. We have to um, run it correctly. So it concerns me if someone's not following the laws and, and, the, and the rules correctly as far as income versus paying taxes. Because uh, our our states and our federal taxes depend on income uh, based of, off of our capitalist system. So, yeah, keep in mind when you're donating money, do you want them to get the money directly and you, you just don't care about that? Or... Um, are you dealing with a, comp, uh, a channel or a group that actually is a legitimate business and actually uh, run the numbers correctly? And so you know your donation is also going towards the proper business ethics of that channel. Those are things to consider. Uh, but yeah, we're talking sometimes hundreds or thousands of dollars that are coming into some of these channels that are not paying taxes on it. Now, if they're making money off of YouTube and things like that, they'll get 1099 and they have to address that income. So that's not an issue whatsoever. So anyway, uh, um, uh, I guess the, the thing is, is uh, it worries me. I'd be really concerned if my daughter was out there or my son was out there uh, traveling the United States and just depending on people donating to them. Um, I'm hope I would always hope that my kids would have gone to school, gotten maybe even a, a skill uh, that they or a trade that they could take with them. And if they got in an issue where they really needed to make money, they knew how to do handyman work, or they knew how to do welding, or they knew how to uh, settle down for a while and do accounting uh, or uh, engineering or anything like that, that they can make legitimate money without. Uh, dropping to a, a, a level of begging. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't, I would never want my kids to do that. My responsibility, I feel as a parent, is to make sure my kids are coached to be adults that have skills. So eventually they may be traveling at first, but later on, life will change. Kids may come along, or maybe they want to get serious, or maybe they want to get a house. How in the heck do you convince a bank of uh, your income if you don't have a job? Or, yeah, I just get donations. I can buy a house. Or I, <laughs> he's like, you got to have a foundation. You got to have a resume. You got to have a portfolio. And that's just how it is. And I would definitely say that it's our responsibility as parents to teach our young adults that. And uh, I, I don't know where that got lost, but there's millennials out there just think they should, should be out there living free and happy. And I understand that. I was that age once too. But I also knew, at least I was taught, the fundamentals of, uh, well, there's certain things you just got to have. And that's a skill uh, of some sort so you can make money. And uh, so anyway, um, it's a concern. And, of course, it makes it look bad in some of these channels. You start watching them, and then something happens to them. And then they go into this begging mode a little bit. And uh, it's a real turnoff, super big turnoff. Where there's others that got big channels that uh, they're making a, a relatively good income from their uh, advertising income. And then they also are doing things through Amazon and uh, some of them have actually got books and things like that. They've created content. 
worthwhile buying and also uh, uh, helps with their lifestyle, that's great stuff. And that you have no idea how much work goes behind like creating a an ebook and the marketing and and writing and of course behind the scenes of getting a a, a book published or at least getting an e uh, ebook version made uh, that you could sell on ClickBank, uh, also through other uh, resources now, uh, still a lot of hard work. And so that is good, legitimate stuff. And, you know, of course, there's a handful of abusers out there that are ruining it for, for those who do legitimate um, products for their channels. So then we're all leery of whether I want to donate to them or buy one of their stickers or or buy one of their books, or buy one of their, uh, um, or you know, some of these, uh, not just RVers and stuff, I have like memberships and things like that, uh, Patreon accounts and things. It's like, anyway, of course, you know, there's this handful of folks that are out there that you need to, as a viewer, identify as uh, um, someone that does that and stop watching them and go to some of these other channels that have worked hard to create content. <clears throat> now, the other thing that gets kind of worrisome with some of these is these guys making content every day on things that are like really private. And so you have to admire the fact that they'll share that with you, but um, there'll come a day where, um, especially once you get children and stuff, um, that you've got to bring it in a little bit, privatize yourself a little bit. Um, I, knowing about certain, you know, all your um, personal issues is, is uh, admirable, but at the same time, where do you draw the line? And so that's probably, you know, for example, a channel like Mean Sherry's definitely doesn't do as well as the other ones because we're not spilling our guts out. Yes, we have our problems. Yes, we have emotional things happen to us. And yes, we have health issues that we just don't want to put on the air. And so <clears throat> um, I see others, you know, they'll literally take their cameras into hospitals. Uh, I jokingly will take a, a camera into a store once in a while. But I, uh, I also got to just, where do you draw the line? And I know that if Sherry and I, exposed more of that kind of stuff our ratings would go crazy but it's like do you really want to live your life with the camera all the time it really gets <laughs> it irritates the people around you a lot too but i mean uh, yes i could do a video every single day and it may be um uh, cleaning my refrigerator do you really want to see me clean my refrigerator uh or you know, vacuuming and things like that. It's like, um, that's daily life. We look at our channel as it's entertainment. And so, um, yes. And it's also, you know, we do do tips and, and products and services reviews and things like that. But YouTube is, uh, and podcasts are also entertainment. We want you to be interested in listening to our shows so I, I, I'm really worried that making sure that when we do do a show, that's something worthwhile seeing. Uh, occasionally, we'll do little private things. Like we just did a video about how I take Cinder outside and, and uh, we relax once a day and we have some private time. And uh, it is very cute. So we did a little three-minute video about that. That's about as private as we want to get. But, uh, you know, uh, that same day, I, I probably ran a 20 errands and stuff like, you know, do I want to drag a camera everywhere I go to a point that people don't even want to be around me? Uh, and, and am I showing you things that really should stay within the private uh, lifestyle of me and Sherry? And uh, so, and Lord knows how much, uh, you know, your kids, if you have kids with you, they don't have a say. They, uh, you're the parents, and so if you're putting a, a, a camera in front of them and their lifestyle, uh, I would tend to try to keep it as private as, as possible and only show a few cute moments, of course, and, you know, uh, give my the kids some privacy. And so, yeah, anyway, interesting stuff. Well, 
Well, getting back to the, the abuse and, and, and having our resources limited, I want to make sure that we make it perfectly clear that uh, I think the stealth camping freedom, RV freedom thing is really cool. And if I was in my 20s and 30s, I would have probably taken advantage of the opportunity to do it. So please don't get me wrong on any of that. Um, if, Like I said, I'm not that age anymore, but it isn't that hard for me to remember back what I was like in my 20s and 30s, and that would have been a fantastic type of thing. Uh, when I was in my 20s and 30s, uh, I was brought up, it was all about business, and so I was chasing the business dream. And, and basically, I also had the dream of the, you know, house and two cars and, and toys and, and, you know, a stable environment. And that's how I was brought up. And, of course, my kids have gone in a different direction. I, I have a daughter that she waited till she was uh, 30 before she got married and did a lot of cool things in her 20s. Uh, she was a ballroom dancer and literally uh, did some professional sh um, um, shows and, 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 and competed and I'm just so glad that she had that opportunity to be herself and not a, a wife and a, and a mother right away and so and uh, of course my son uh, had um, military time and then he uh, uh, discovered his uh, niche and so he's had the opportunity uh, to follow that dream um, and then started settling down late in late 20s so I really I feel I do feel that uh, having that opportunity to to have the freedoms to travel or RV travel with the RV freedom uh, and we're not and some people have done backpacking in Europe and things like that uh, is all great and stuff but you do need it does come a time you bring it back in and so you have to ask yourself okay maybe you know um, can we pass on the fact of trying your hardest between 18 and 24 to have skills that are um, uh, something worth putting on your resume then hitting the road and doing uh, some of these things that you'll have a once in a lifetime opportunity to do basically because you're young you got lots of energy and your health is good um, to go for it and I, I truly truly understand that and so uh, um, you know, like when I was a kid I was also a, a deckhand working in Westport working on the fishing boats and so uh, I was like 17 18 at the time it was the coolest experience I'll never never ever forget that uh, opportunity to live on my own we lived in a little trailer and uh, in the summers we worked the boats and it was, it was even a little dangerous but um, I learned so much from that and I met lots of neat people and got to do an activity that I certainly can't do at this age anymore. Man, working on those fishing boats was something else. So yes, I understand the dream. I understand the feelings and stuff. But uh, um, but then there's, of course, uh, uh, the guys out there that are you know, begging for money and, and, and not working and trying to beat the system and not paying taxes and probably don't have health insurance and things like that uh, and then they're going to places and using our resources that we've been given uh, like the Walmarts and places to stay and, and in cities that allow overnight uh, parking for certain places to allow tourists to come in and out um, and then they come in and abuse that and, and use those resources and maybe even uh, leave garbage and, and even dump their tanks in some of these places and uh, it's terrible, and, and it's only a small handful, but uh, I guess the conclusion on this whole thing is we need to police them. The other thing is we need to educate them and somehow either get them, you know, stop them, or try to get them to care enough about the resources around them that it lasts for a long period of time for all of us. And so that's the concern of this show is are our RV uh, resources being abused? And if they are, is that going to cause us to lose some of them, which we already have? And what can we do to educate that 1% or 2% of folks that are uh, causing this issue? And maybe uh, it's ignorance. And so 
uh, I beg of those people that are making channels to uh, produce shows that sh uh, show etiquettes of how to be in a national park, how to be in a state park, how to use, uh, like Just Incredibles, done some great stuff about how he goes about staying in the city uh, parking lots and meeting the city's ordinances and how to be on BLM land and, and not lose those privileges and, and what do I need to do to be prepared for that? What tools come in handy? What do I do about garbage? What do I do about those things? I urge all those people that are are, are doing the stealth camping and, and, and jumping from and trying to keep their costs as low as possible by staying uh, outside of the RV parks and, and RV resorts. How are they doing it in a way that they'd be welcome back the next time they came through? Those really need to be emphasized. They really need to be shared with uh, this new generation that are looking for this RV freedom, or all of us are going to start losing more and more privileges. And that's really my concern in this show. And uh, last but not least, there's also the abuse or things or privileges that we lose in RV parks and RV resorts itself. And of course, this is another sensitive area, but I see rigs come into this place and they've got you know, two, three cars sometimes, and a motorcycle. And then, of course, these RV parks are only designed for two vehicles at the most. And so it looks like a used car lot in some of these places. And then, of course, the RV parks have to get stricter. And so pretty soon, you know, there is exceptions to things that happen. Like, for example, uh, me, um, I have a boat. So... Uh, it would be really cool if I was getting ready to go launch the boat. I could swing by my my space here real quick, park in front of it, and put the boat on a battery charger for an hour or two before we took it up to the lake. And of course, um, now that so much of this, uh, you know, the park's full and they got people are just doing you know parking all over the place. And of course, you know, the security or the RV police <laughs> are trying to uh, limit that. Uh, I get yelled, you know, I, I don't have that privilege, especially now that the park's full. Uh, and of course, the first thing I would do is go to the office and ask for permission to do that. Could I park in front of my space just long enough for an hour to uh, charge my rig? And I would say no, they'll give me other options and maybe no options at all. And that's just tough. That's just how it is. It's an RV park. I don't own this. And that's the thing I always kind of like, okay, you got this RV freedom and stuff, but is it that much freedom? I mean, yeah, you can change your, uh, your surroundings, but you don't own the property that you're staying on. It's somebody else's property. Even on BLM land, it's not yours. Uh, someone can come along and say, you guys need to leave. Uh, so, you know, this freedom of, of, you know, going through, and it's, you know, we do have public lands and I understand that too. Um, but, uh, RV parks, you know, those folks that, uh, uh, abuse the facilities or to abuse the, uh, you know, you know, shut things like pools off at 10 o'clock, people won't leave on time or people build fires or have, uh, fires in their, um, RV parks in some places have ordinances of no fires whatsoever, uh, and yet they still do it. Others will have uh, <laughs> big fences around their RVs with uh, pets and things like that. Where do you draw the line and all this stuff? And so, yeah, it's not just the outside areas. Even the RV parks and RV resorts have people that take rules to the edge, and it'll only be one or two uh, percent of people and but you know the main offices have to say I'm sorry if I say no to this I have to say that no to everyone and so what little privileges we did have or could have had have been taken away because it was abused so once again those of you who have channels and stuff talk about etiquette What's proper at an RV park? What's proper at an RV resort? 
and go talk to the owners of these RV resorts and get their opinion. Remember, it's a business for them too. They need to make money. They have to uh, uh, throw garbage out. They have to maintain this area. They have taxes to pay. So it's a business to them. So if they're losing money or people aren't coming here uh, because uh, the park isn't very good or, or, or there's too much abuse or it's not kept clean and things like that, uh, you know, and it, to keep it clean and keep uh, the plants up and stuff, it takes manpower. That costs money too. So you have to look through their eyes. Go talk to the owners and say, what is happening? What is the things that make your job hard? And, and what are the things that hurt your cost and your profits? And, and uh, what can we relay in our videos and our channel to other RVers to make it better and so we don't lose privileges? And because uh, we always want, you know, exceptions to the rules when we need it because we're human and so that'll always be a reality so it's up to us to uh, communicate well don't assume anything ask permission and do things properly and right and and use the resources correctly so the next person behind you can use it and so and uh and you know of course you always want to be invited back to places that you've been have gone to so yeah, uh, RV parks, they even have the problem too. And, you're, and just because you're paying money doesn't mean that you uh, can go beyond the rules and regulations of that RV park. Uh, they have a responsibility to have a safe facility, a clean facility, and a kept up facility. And they must abide by the ordinances and laws of the area that they live in. So keep that in mind. So there you go. I stepped in it. I probably created a bombshell and I did not meaning to. I just think it's something that needs to be discussed. And I think because all of us that do have channels and, and uh, vlogs and, and good blogs and, uh, you know, have the opportunity here to continue to educate the people that are uh, coming into the RV lifestyle. And that's what we uh, focus on at this show is the RV lifestyle. And there's nothing more uh, disheartening than finding out something you were able to do like a year before you can't do anymore because somebody ruined it for the rest of us. And that's really what we're trying to prevent here. So the responsibility of our channel and our radio shows is to to make things better and fun for the RVer at the same time educate them of, of those who might take that and go a little too far with some of it and so anyway I hope that's what we get out of this show I hope the comments below that we get from either Facebook or from uh, the video comments or just uh, letters that come in are positive feedback to others to help prevent us losing these wonderful privileges we have outside of RV parks and resorts. So with that in mind, thank you very much for listening. I'm Rob Scribner with RV Talk Radio. This was episode 75. We look forward to talking to everybody on episode 76. We ask everybody to be safe out there. And most of all, if you don't have one yet, buy yourself an RV. Bye for now. <laughs>